So I would love to get this started. We are here for Ask the Experts about container design and planting. I'm Diane Blazik, the Executive Director for National Garden Bureau. And we have four panelists with us today. I will briefly introduce them and let each one of them then introduce themselves. And by the way, also in my office, we have Gail Pabst and she's gonna be posting some links in the chat. So if you wonder who this person is who keeps posting links, that's that's Gail. Um, our panelists are Marcus Jansen from Pan American Seed and Jessica Kudnick from American Taki, Becky Paxton from, let's see here, which hat are you wearing today, Becky? Southern Living Plant Collection. Okay, excellent. And Barbara Wise from Crescent Garden. So let's go back through that order. And Marcus, tell me a little bit about yourself and your company. Yes, Marcus Jansen. I'm a product development manager for Pan American Seed. I've been here for three years, based in Elburn, Illinois, the Western Chicago suburbs. And so I am a gardener of Zone 5B now and uh, a container gardener. I believe it or not, I don't have a yard of my own. So I am a container gardener by nature. And Pan American Seed, we're in the business of breeding plants and uh, distributing seed products all around the world. So that's annuals, perennials, vegetables and, and herbs, cut flowers, and potted plants alike. We dabble in a lot of different things from wave petunia to dragon wing begonia. We've got a lot of products on the market. So glad to be here today. Thank you. And Jessica. I love Marcus that you were like, I, this is what zone I am. <laughs> I, I should I should start starting uh, including it in my intro. Uh, so I'm Jessica. I'm with American Taki. Um, uh, we are a Japanese company all over the world uh, that breeds and produces seed items, so vegetables, cut flowers, um, cotton bedding items. I though am in Georgia, so I'm zone I think eight B now with the change. Maybe let's just say eight for sure. And um, I certainly have a yard, but I also have containers uh, because I like to get my hands dirty and do it all, so. Excellent. Okay, Becky. Hey, everybody. It's so nice to see you. I am Becky, speaking to you from Southern Living Plant Collection. Southern Living Plant Collection provides innovative plants that meet some of the toughest landscaping challenges here in the South. Um, one of the landscaping challenges that I have is that I have an incredibly small space to garden in. And so a lot of the containers, um, these photographs are taken in my backyard. Um, I love uh, container gardening, and I'm really excited to, to talk with you guys about this today. Thank you. And and I like that because I think pretty much everyone submitted photos from their own backyard or from their uh, their work, what they've done in various places. Jessica, I know that yours were from our recent event, the California Spring Trials. So yeah, we have very few photo fancy photographer, formal photography. A lot of this is directly from our panelists. So, um, okay, Barbara, let's introduce yourself. All right. Uh, I am also from Nashville, Tennessee. I work for a company called Crescent Garden and Crescent Garden designs and manufactures our own lightweight decorative planters. We are known for our True Drop planter, which is a, uh, a planter that is self-watering, which we can get into exactly what it means by self-watering sometime during this. Um, but I got started doing this because I was in landscape and design for about 20 years and I ended up specializing in in container designs and doing that um, I averaged about 800 uh, containers a season and um, and just fell in love with it it was just a fun way to create beautiful spaces uh, in people's yards and I'm in uh, I guess Nashville is uh, 6b great okay so we definitely have some experienced container gardeners here and one of the questions, we do have a presentation and we will go into that soon. Um, housekeeping thing, if you have any questions, you can put them in the Q&A um, on the webinar box or you can use chat. I'll, I'll look at both. Um, so we'll make sure that we can get those answered. But one of the fun things I thought that we could ask everybody is what is the main question that you get from friends, family, customers about container gardening. I thought that would be a good way to get started. And that way we probably are going to cover the main questions. <laughs> Not to say that you can't ask more, but uh, okay, let's go circle back again. Marcus, what's the number one question you get when 
you're talking to people about container gardening. Yeah, the number one question I get is so nebulous, but it's as simple as what should I plant? And that usually has to, you know, the follow-up questions are required. You know, where are you growing? Sun or shade? What do you like? So um, I think it's a bigger question, but I oftentimes like to just give people plants and get them started and say, mm -hmm. here's some plants, plant those. And when they can have success with those, then they come back, right, for more questions, for more plants. So if we can create gardeners, then we're getting in the right place. But that's mm -hmm. the question I get is what to plant. Mm -hmm. So it depends on how much time you have. You know, right. we, could, we could talk plants all day. So. Yeah. And we're devoting a full hour to that. So um, stay tuned. We'll have those answers. Jessica, what's the question you get? Well, yeah, it's either super general, like what Marcus mentioned is what to plant. I get that. Um, or like super specific. I have one uh, person, it's family member, who only likes white. Mm. And so she always asks uh, what will work. Uh, during this different seasons, that's like white flowering. Um, I, she had recently taken a trip to LA, which anything grown in California is uh, protected by California magic. And she wanted to put cyclamens because um, they do them in the landscape in LA. And I, and she's in, uh, she's in Georgia. And I was like, no, 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 that will not work uh, for um, all season color. That's more of a, of a pot protected item. So yeah, it's either super general or like, I, I want this one specific look. But I don't want to have to care for it. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's good. Okay, uh, Barbara, how about you? What's the question you get? Uh, probably the most common is um, how many plants can I put in my planter, and um, and which is a really hard one to answer. Usually, my my first response is how much money do you have? Because <laughs> if you want to put, you know, you can fill it up, cram it full. Um, I, you know, and that's kind of my cheeky answer. Um, the, I think the best answer to that is, um, is just what kind of look are you going for? And, um, if you, if you want something wild and crazy, you're going to add more plants. Um, you do want to make sure that before you plant anything in a planter, um, that you know how big it's going to get. And so if you have a, if you have a 16 inch planter and you have, you know, 10 plants in there that each get 10 inches each that, I mean, you can, doesn't take a whole lot of math skills to figure out that's not going to really work real well. So, um, so we will probably answer more of that question as we get into more details about design too. Yes. Yes. Okay. And Becky, so we're going to ask you the same question. And then while we have you on screen, I think we'll start our presentation because your slides are the first. So, Go ahead and tell us the question that you get asked. Um, one that we get all the time that's so fun is if I have container plantings, am I still allowed to go on vacation? Like, <laughs> can I leave them? Do I have to get a babysitter for them? Um, it's so funny, but it's one of those things that's always on our mind. You know, you've like taken care of everything. And especially um, here in the South, they get so hot in the summer. We have these nightmare scenarios of our planters drying out and losing all our hard work. So, uh, you know, one of the things that we we like to tell people, you know, there's all kinds of fabulous tools like self-watering planters and, and um, you know, having drips. Um, but if you have a plant that's low maintenance, that's low water requirements to begin with, um, sometimes just knowing that you've got this easy care plant to begin with, um, and it's, you know, in the right medium uh, goes so far towards easing those worries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. Okay. So we're definitely going to be talking more about watering after our presentation. So let's get started with this and... Oh, sorry, I forgot that I was first. Um, what I wanted to do is just point out, this is the website, National Garden Bureau, ngb.org. Um, I circled the combo ideas page. Um, we don't have everybody's combos that are here right now up on that page, but we'll try to get those up there. But we have lots and lots of combos and we add to them very frequently, especially after industry events where we see people, see our members that have some different combinations. So if you want additional inspiration, this is a good place to go. Okay, Becky, now you can take it over. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, we are so excited to chat with you guys about containers today. This is one um, that we came up with because we wanted a four season 
uh, planter, something that was so easy that we could have a great foundational shrub in um, and then just sub out the little guys from season to season. And so we started, this is actually Autumn Sunburst on Court Azalea. Um, Autumn Sunburst is gorgeous. It's got these beautiful um, bicolor blooms that are just, they're huge. They're about two and a half inches. Um, it's got evergreen foliage, like all of the azaleas from the Encore line. Um, and then with that as our foundation, knowing that it's going to flower in spring and then again in summer and again in the fall and be evergreen in the winter, the question was just, what do we sub in from here? And so we went with a variegated English ivy and then some violas and pansies too. Great. And you, you just said something that I like, the foundation plant. So um, you can elaborate a little bit more on that as we go to the next slide. Sure. So this next one, speaking of a foundational plant, one of the things that we love to play with in Southern Living Plant Collection is using woody shrubs in planters. Why? There's a lot of reasons for that. One of the best is that when you're thinking about container plantings or something that goes on your porch or maybe in a hanging basket, you want something that's bold enough and, and big enough to be seen from the street. And so uh, woody shrubs, especially these ones that are a little bit smaller, just getting started maybe in year one, that's a great way um, to draw visual interest. And I, I see a question here, which mum did you use? I wish I could tell you, this was the last one on the shelf. It didn't have a tag on it. It just had a price tag. And so I snagged it because I thought that color was so unusual. Um, the reason I wanted a mum with a little bit more of a pinkier hue is that it was going to play and pair with Juliet Clara, which is sort of the hero shrub in this planting. It's the the thriller in the back that you see with the variegated foliage. Juliet Clara is really interesting because you can see the yellow um, hue that it has on the exterior of the foliage, but it actually emerges maroon when it first comes out. And so you get this beautiful um, story throughout the course of this season that's really interesting. And then likewise, that deep um, saturated hue on the purple pixie dwarf weeping lower petalum, that's an evergreen. So it's going to carry that all the way through four seasons. Um, this is another one of those planters that just looks good month after month. Um, sweet potato vine, always really vigorous, especially um, in our area. And then um, mums provided that little bit of seasonal interest. But when you're going away from those classic fall colors, you get something that that tells a story um, that you can maybe even start a little bit earlier in the summer, just so it, it, you know, it doesn't feel like pumpkin land all the way through fall. And do you happen to know the size of this planter? That it large. is it is very large. It's about four and a half feet tall and it's probably maybe 20, 22 inches. Um, across. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Um, this Ooh. is so fun. I know I love this. This is one that I wish was at my house. Um, <laughs> this is a beautiful design, um, that our, um, our, team at Southern Living Plants put together. Um, it's got saucy red salvia um, is that gorgeous bloom in the back. And this is so interesting. It's a self-cleaning salvia. And so it's really low fuss. Um, Sunshine Ligustrum is just such a standby in the Southern Living Plant collection. You can see it's that taller plant in the back. Um, it's a woody shrub. It's got, um, it's evergreen um, up to zone seven. It's I think semi-deciduous in zone six, but um, it absolutely shines when it gets that sunlight on it. And then it, that color story is echoed in the Carex Everillo. If you've never grown one of these um, Carexes, they're just absolutely a tough, tough plant. They are mostly evergreen. Um, so they look great in all four seasons. And then again, that purple pixie dwarf weeping lower petalum is something we love in these planters because it bridges the gap between filler and spiller. It's just got a lot of volume. It's got big color. Um, and it's something that plays so well with that red, yellow, purple color story. Oh, another one that just absolutely a wow moment. Um, the scabiosa in the top is just so playful and whimsical, the way that those blooms are kind of dancing in every direction. Um, and then it's got this really lush verbena um, as the middle layer. And then it's, it's just cocooned in Laura Petalum. This is a really good example of a planter. Some of the ones we saw earlier are, are um, almost meant to be viewed in one direction. They would look really good pushed up against a wall. This is something that looks really beautiful in the round. You can see when it was designed, it was almost a bullseye shaped pattern where you have um, that top layer of the scabiosa and then it's it's got a ring of the verbena around it and a ring of the uh, Laura Petalum around it. And so when you're thinking about designing your planter, you wanna really consider perspective. Is this something that my guests are gonna wander around, maybe at the side of a pool, or is this something that's going to be pushed tight against a wall, maybe flanking a doorway? 
And then this is such a fun combination. This comes to us from Steph Green of Contained Creation. She's a wonderful um, Southern container designer based out of Virginia. Um, and this is just a tribute to the woody shrub. You can see three woody shrubs in here. Um, and this is one that, that, again, if you're looking for something, if you're maybe thinking about listing your house this year and you want to have a planter that's visible all the way from the street, um, you want to lean on these great woody shrubs, especially ones with a upright um, or a really compact growth habit. Um, I want to call out Diamond Spire Gardenia for just that reason. Diamond Spire is the plant that you see in the back. Here it's just getting started. This plant will reach up to three feet and it keeps that really narrow columnar shape to it. Um, it's got very interesting foliage for a gardenia. A lot of gardenias will have like kind of more of an um, ovate shaped leaf and this is coin shaped, um, but it's still really shiny. So love that gardenia foliage. Of course, we can't talk about gardenias without that fabulous fragrance. Another fun one if you're talking about container plantings because you can put it close to areas where, where people will be engaging with them. And again, our old friend, Purple Pixie Laura Petalum, we love it. Uh, Sunshine Ligastrum, and then the Diplodinias are providing that summertime uh, seasonal interest. Great, thank you. I think this is your your last one. All right, last but certainly not least, Heartthrob right. Hydrangea is a terrific wow. pick. You can see it here, really at um, at the heart of the color that it. it hits it starts out a really interesting sharp chartreuse green in the blooms, and so we're echoing that with the creeping Jenny here. But as the blooms um, come come into their 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 own, they hit this gorgeous red color that gives it the name um, heartthrob. And then it, it maxes out. It's a very compact uh, hydrangea. And so it really reaches, I think, about three feet by three feet um, in totality. Um, but just a really great container hydrangea. People are loving cut flowers now, um, especially folks who may not have a lot of in-ground space to garden. And so if you're looking for a cut flower garden in containers, these more compact hydrangeas are just right for that. So we do have another question about these foundation plants, and I wanted to go back and kind of reiterate that you are speaking on behalf of Southern Living Plants. Mm -hmm. And the question says, do you let them overwinter or do you plant them in ground before winter? Um, you know, I, and I can only speak for myself, um, for some of these, I think it just, it, it's hard to, uh, to generalize. It just really depends on the plants. You know, there's some of them, um, that maybe had a phenomenal run spring, summer, fall. I know, you, you know, we know that a lot of plants, when you put them in a container, um, especially if that container is not insulated or weatherproof, that that's going to be something where the roots are a little bit more susceptible to cold. And so if I know that I'm growing something in a container that's marginally hardy, that's something I'm going to go ahead and put in the ground, probably close to the house. Um, before the season hits, or I'm going to just make a plan and say, you know what, this one's going in my garage, this one's going in my basement or going in a nice sunny window before the season. So I, I, I hate to say it depends on the plant, but it really does. Depend exactly. On yeah. It depends on where you're located in the plant and yeah, multiple, multiple things, how you treat the, the container over the winter. So um, maybe that's another whole topic for us is winterizing <laughs> containers. So, okay. Next up, uh, Jessica, I believe it is your turn. Hi, yes. So uh, we, of course, at Taki breed um, both cut flower items and pot and bedding items, and it's all from seed. And one thing that I have noticed in all of my product development work is just how important, yeah, combination planters are. And yet we as a company hadn't really started playing with our own material. And so that's been a huge focus for the past three years. Um, is creating combinations from our own uh, material. So this one I created for our recent uh, show that we had in California. It's called Stunning Scarlet. And if you're ever stuck on where to start, monochromatic is an excellent starter to start playing with your combination uh, planter journey. So in this case, I, ch I, st I st stuck with scarlet and red items, um, choosing something tall. So in the back, that tall item is the uh, Canna Canova Scarlet. Uh, I chose something that had like interesting dark foliage, which is the Dahlia Black Forest Ruby that's new this year. And then, you know, um, we have sort of touched on it, but there's this idea of, yeah, thriller, spiller, and um, filler. And so for the filler slash spiller um, is in the front, that Petunia Trilogy Red uh, Gen 2, and kind of like highlighting it because I had a little extra space. And that's why you should feel total, uh, you know, creative 
just do what you think make, makes sense. I actually stuck a coleus in there because I felt like, hmm, I need a little something. And this coleus is, is the giant um, exhibition. It's actually rustic red. But even though it doesn't have a flower, it, there's a lot of coleus and foliage items that you can add to planters that add color and interest. And so this one, yeah, is, is stunning scarlet. And oh, yes, yeah, so I was actually looking at my screen where I have this duplicated, <laughs> but the, nobody's moving my screen, so I should, <laughs> I should watch yours. Um, so sticking with the monochromatic, I actually, and so this is the one I sent to my sister-in-law because she is, uh, she loves everything white for her planters. Um, so this one features, yeah, Petunia Trilogy White. Um, a, a can of South Pacific white and then Zinnia preciosa white. And you'll notice that these planters I'm I'm talking to you uh, about now are definitely great for um, where I'm at in Georgia. So it's hot, it's humid. All these plants were selected to have that wonderful color for the uh, spring, summer and sort of into fall season. These while the canna will um, probably overwinter, depending on where you're at, uh, these are meant to be changed out so that you, I'm kind of, I want to change stuff up and like have fun with plants. So yeah, these I will enjoy and then they get refreshed uh, the next time around. So this one, yeah, is Whisper White. And Pretty in Pink, this one, um, you know, is more of a rectangle, a rectangular uh, planter which meant that we could have um, some different tall items in the back. So in the back, you'll see that Salvia Summer Jewel Pink, AAS winner. Uh, this Salvia, the Summer Jewel series, actually every year I grow it, I am so, I'm still in shock at how quick it is to flower. So you go from this teeny tiny little plant to like immediate spikes just coming and they just keep coming all summer long. Uh, so the hummingbirds love this, uh, the pollinators love this one. And then next to it is the uh, Melinus, uh, it's actually a yeah, silver uh, silver queen um, for a nice like grass. Uh, so it's still textural, but green. And then of course, more color in the front with um, Petunia Trilogy Pink and then um, a Zinnia Preciosa Pink. And, you know, when you want to look at you know, Barbara was saying your your container and the like longevity of the the plants. Check out uh, like how they will evolve. So I already know that this zinnia zinnia preciosa it is meant to stay compact, so it will stay nice and tidy. Because uh, you know some zinnias are cut flower zinnias and some are too too petite and tiny. This one's like a nice medium, uh, which will have you know flower after flower, and so a little bit of like. Uh, Googling, you know, how the plants perform can help uh, so that you don't have to play too much referee. I don't, and this is also where how you as a gardener plays a part because I actually don't mind doing a little bit of refereeing throughout the season. It makes me feel important. <laughs> um, so I don't mind maybe crowding mine in a little bit because I'll just go out there and, and make sure everybody's playing nicely together. But yeah, if you have, if you need hands off, and if you need, I'm gone all summer, so I don't want to have to uh, manage them. There are plants that fit that as well. And yes, I did correct the spelling on this, but um, it looks like I might have grabbed the wrong PowerPoint. So we'll see as we get through here, because um, Barbara, yep. I know I have changes on yours. So we'll make sure I have the right PowerPoint. If not, I might have to quit sharing my screen, let you guys talk, and I'll bring a different one up. So we'll see what happens in the next couple of slides. No worries. And then, yeah, amazing amethyst. So actually... My birthday's in June, so amethyst, my my birthstone. So this one is great uh, for me. And we've paired, uh, again, other like heat loving summer items. Um, the petunia in the front. Now it's a white petunia, but because of that, we call it a silver blotch. Um, because of that blotch, it means that it can pair well with some of the other colors that we have in the purple uh, tone. So that ornamental pop, uh, pepper onyx orange. It actually will have orange fruits, but even in this early stage, uh, it's still very attractive because of the black and, and purple foliage. Um, again, I use, used grass to sort of break up, um, you know, too much heavy color and add um, texture interest. And then um, 
Yeah, and again, I love the the salvia summer jewel lavender. It's the salvia, and you think hot, humid, you know, performer. But the lavender, it's very cool and and calming to fit with mm -hmm. this planter. And then, of course, the Mathiola harmony uh, violet color. Now, Mathiola is a stock. It does like cooler temperatures, and so this might be one that, as it flowers and is done, I'll either just yank it out or replace it, or by yanking it out, I've actually created space for the rest of the planter to continue throughout the summer. And that was one of my questions for later. So you're saying yank. We'll have to clarify that later about exactly how to do it. <laughs> what exactly is a yank? Right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. And uh, we, so those planters that you saw were all like um, talking material, but one of the benefits of working in the industry is I do have access to other uh, breeders material. And so at this show, there were two other companies there. And so I was able to sort of like grab um, items that, that um, they had uh, growing as well. Again, canna is great for that, for the summer. This one's called red, golden flame. It's a bicolor. So this one you can do a lot with because it has both those colors. And of course it is the thriller because of um, that stunning bicolor. Uh, we added that Dahlia Black Forest uh, Ruby again with the dark foliage. Uh, I love dark foliage items. And when you pair them with crisp green, it really um, sets them off as a contrast. Uh, a Zinnia Belize Double Orange. Zinnias, very tough plants, flowers on top of flowers. Those will perform all summer. Um, Agastache um, Arizona Sandstone. That's a tough one as well. So um, even in the landscape or in pots, this one uh, can handle, um, I saw the question, I'll, I'll answer it about the canna. Uh, so even this agastache will handle a bit of, you know, dry temperatures and, and hot, like in container uh, temperatures. Rubecchia, Claire Orange, and then of course, um, we put a yellow Gerbera in there in the back. So the question was, how tall is the, that canna? Now, um, that's a great question because um your landscape or bulb cannas are like you're thinking like five feet tall or eight feet tall this is the canova series it's from seed and they are compact so this might top out 30 inches maybe um yeah maybe 24 30 depending on how you're watering it and how you know uh, like constricted it is because it can stay more petite when you kind of keep it in a smaller pot. Um, but yeah, these will not get so garga gargantuan that they take over everything. Great. Thank you. Um, is pink classic your last one, maybe? I think so. Okay. Um, so pink classic. Yeah. Uh, I'm a fan of pink. It is something that will show stop in your front yard or uh, in your garden. And this one, actually, you guys should check out uh, our YouTube channel because this one is this is a snapshot from a video I did of me doing a live combination planter demo demonstration. So this one features a uh, trilogy cherry morn. That's that bicolor. So again, because it has two different colors, it allows a greater palette uh, to be used and look nice together. You see it in the back. So that's Salvia Summer Jewel White, AES winner. And then, of course, Zinnia Preciosa Pink. You can see the you love using these because I know they will perform. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Thank you so much, Jessica. Now we're going to pop over to Barbara and yeah. her containers that are all in crescent containers. Right. And so because we have the experts on plants, I'm going to talk a little bit more about using containers in creative ways. Um, I do have to throw out a plug to the Canova. I love using the Canova uh, canas um, in my planters. I also love using the encores in my containers. So I've just planted about six of them and I'm trying out the diamond spire. So anyway, just kind of throwing that out. I'm, I think those are great plants. So this, um, I wanted to just point out to folks that um, you know, planters are a great way when you have tiny little close spots where you can create um, a whole lot of privacy here with just one planter. This plant, this is one of our mod planters. It's about 40 inches long or 40 inches wide. And, um, and with just a couple of fiddle leaf figs. And when you get those fiddle leaf figs in there with their big, massive leaves, um, you can, I mean, you could be sitting there, you know, drinking your coffee, you know, I wouldn't say totally naked because somebody could come around the corner, but you could be sitting there and have a whole lot of privacy just with this one container. So use your containers to create privacy.
And this is a self-watering, our, our mod is a self-watering. The fiddly figs love self-watering planters because it just, they like that consistent, even watering. Um, so, you know, the, it doesn't, it's not soggy in there. They just get a consistent watering and you can see how healthy these plants are. I like to tell people when they're putting together combinations to finish well, um, this is a fun combination using some of those color echoes of, uh, you've got, um, the Biden's bee dance, the begonia orange chocolate, you've got a croton in there. You're echoing the the oranges and the yellows in there. And that's just that's a really important design thing when you when you're putting together your planter um, to have that color echo. Uh, it makes it feel like there's some thought that went into the container and to the design. Uh, but the main thing I wanted to show you is when you're I like to start my plants off small. Um, again, you're, that kind of goes back to the question, well, how many can you put in there if they're small? I like to give them room to grow. Um, you want to have room for the, you, you don't want to just fill your potting soil with so much root mass that it's really hard to keep them watered. So by starting them small, a lot of times you're going to have soil left that looks kind of, you know, I mean, it doesn't look as good as it will in maybe in a few weeks. So one of the things you can do is put something interesting in there, like um, like these blue glass pieces in there, just to kind of, and the blue really pops in there with the orange. Um, so just a kind of a fun little way to start small so that your plants have room to grow and uh, but then make it look good to start off in front of your house. Um, I had to throw this in here because um, one and and I didn't answer your question. The question I probably get the most is: Is there anything you haven't ever planted in a planter, and uh, or is there anything you can't plant in a planter, and? Um, my uh, my brother is a is a cotton farmer, and I had asked him one time if you could grow cotton in a planter, and he was like, oh, I don't know, because they're kind of, you know, they like the soil really dry. But this is our smaller uh, mod planter. It is a self-watering planter, but I planted these from seed. This is a variegated leaf cotton. It is absolutely gorgeous uh, throughout the you know, throughout the season. And uh, I mean, and I got, I got tons of cotton balls from it. Um, I, I, I planted two um, of them, but it, you know, it just produced and produced and produced. And it was just a fun, interesting plant to have in a container. So um, just throw that out, be willing to try something different. And actually, I used to say you couldn't grow peonies in planters and I have had peonies for about uh, almost five years in planters too. So try something new and different in your planter. Um, I loved this fun combination. Um, we had a contest up at Bailey Nursery and, um, uh, you know, just trying to do different things with containers. Uh, this is just a great example of creating layers in your planters. Um, and uh, it's, we've got the, the Endless Summer Pop Star Hydrangea, the Easy Elegance All Range Rose, the Blue Lobelia, Latana and Cordyline. Um, but what this does, and this is one that um, I think maybe Becky was talking about, or I, I guess everybody's mentioned just seeing them all the way around. You can walk all the way around this planter, but you also have layers. You've got the tall and you've got kind of, you know, the, um, the, the rose that kind of comes down a little bit further down, you've got the lantana um, and the hydrangeas that are kind of on either side, either side, just creating another little layer. So creating layers in your planters. And, um, and then this is just, you know, 
I remember uh, being at a, talking at a show one time and folks were going, well, you know, what are we going to do in the winter? We live up in Montana and everything dies, you know, that's left in a planter. And I said, well, you don't have to put something that's actually growing in a planter. You can use cut greenery and um, and then accessorize it, you know, find, you know, put ribbons, um, you know, the uh, I love using red twig dogwood stems in there. Um you know, using fun little accent pieces, willow, willow, uh, little willow, what are my branch, branches, willow branches in there. Um, so creating this. And I will tell you, uh, uh, to, the best way to do this is to mound, is, is, is to have your planter full of soil and mound it up just a slight bit. Uh, and that, when you mound it up, when you mound your soil, pack it really hard, that helps you have a little bit, um, it makes it a little bit easier when you're trying to create the different heights. And the grand finale for you, Barbara? Yes, I love doing things that um, that will draw my grandkids into wanting to look at a planter and wanting to look at plants. And so one of the things I did one year was just create kind of like a little village in a planter and uh, they could come and look and, you know, look at the little houses that we had lights on the little rosemary that was in the back and, um, and, and they could actually turn the little street lights on and it just as a way to engage them in, uh, you know, it, it, you know, anything that can get them going, okay, plants are not just something that mom makes me go and dig in the yard and put in the ground, but it's something that they can engage with and have fun with. Great. Thank you. I like that for inspiration. Keep it in mind for, for the next season. Okay. And Marcus, I think here, uh, let's see here. You gave me a before and after, yeah. but, yeah. oh, shoot. I, um, I put them one on top of each other. So this is the before picture. Yeah, no worries. I'll just preface some of this. I think the hardest part of this whole panel was Diane telling us that we had to narrow it down to six containers. I could have spent the whole day, you know, talking about containers. I've got thousands of photos. So I tried to narrow it down to a few seasons and a few applications, both sun and shade. We're going to feature annuals, perennials, shrubs, uh, herbs in here as well, tropical plants. I even have a little some teasers from um, the Southern Living Collection and the Easter egg from Taki. So, uh, but we're going to talk about, um, you know, I work for Pan American Seed. We're going to feature some of our product, but from my sister companies at Ball Flora Plant, Darwin Perennials, Selecta, um, we all color the world together and can do it with plants. So uh, first we'll get into a container here. This is a full shade application at my parents' house. They have some great containers that they let me play with every year. Um, and I am a greedy gardener that has a bad habit of overfilling containers. So what you're seeing here is actually a Mother's Day planting. And believe it or not, that's a sparse planting for me. I had showed a lot of control by giving space in there. But those are all seed items that you see. And I don't know if, Diane, if you can show the transition um, to the full container or just pull it aside even. Yeah, um, since it's in the, this mode, I can't do it right now let me let me figure out maybe by the end of the presentation right. i'll figure out another way to fair do it enough, fair enough but we'll talk through what's going on here these are all seed items so um in the back you've got griffin begonia looks small now but that plant gets massive huge tropical looking begonia with that very jurassic-esque foliage you've got classic kong coleus rose in the middle kind of anchoring down giving you that foliage color in the front you've got a solar scape impatience that's an interspecific right. impatience from seed that one happens to be Magenta Bliss. And then you got two um, team players in foliage on the side that are going to give us cascade and drape down that tall container. A classic asparagus springer eye on the, on the left. That happens to be Fuzzy Fern Frizz, one of our newer introductions, a new take on a classic foliage item with asparagus fern. And uh, one of our fan favorites in Dichondra Silver Falls there on the right. That's uh, Dichondra bringing that silver foliage and that thing will cascade down. It hit the bottom of the container within a matter of a month and I had to kept tr keep trimming it back at my parents' house. But by 4th of July, when I visited them again, this thing was huge and full. So just a reminder, you can plant sparse and these plants will fill in. Uh, it's, it's quite impressive. The beauty of some of these as well is um, they double as houseplants and foliage items. So at the end of the season, this container was kicking at my 
parents' place in Quincy, Illinois, until October 1, or like, you know, mid-October, uh, which is pretty good for here, here for us in the north. And uh, they took the griffin begonia and the asparagus fern inside and now have them as houseplants indoors. So kind of double, double duty there. Great. Um, we'll go on to the next container. Maybe, maybe at some point, Diane can show us that finished product. Oh, now I'll we're here in the, the, um, the Gardens of All. And got a couple of just great structural plants that I think are no brainers and easy for a new gardener or, or a, a seasoned gardener. We've got in the top for that height, for that thriller, you've got that salvia blue chill. That's a, like a mealy cup sage salvia, but got some big heights and big spires on it. These, these boys get up to like three foot tall and taller, even, you know, four foot tall in some instances with that very cooling light blue color. You've got classic wave purple coming down the side. Gardeners have been using wave petunias for years and for good reason. Uh, they, they do well in containers and landscapes alike. And then you've got a couple accent items there with a double flowering euphorbia from our friends at Ball Floor Plant in that flurry. Yeah. And th this is maybe an example where um, we might have wanted to use a, a bit bigger of a euphorbia that can compete with the beasts that are <laughs> the, the wave and the, the, the mystic or the blue chill salvia, but still a good euphorbia nonetheless. Um, and then on the right, you've that silver foliage you see there, that silver swirl from our friends at Darwin, a fun senecio with good foliage texture, almost dusty miller texture, but more cut leaf fun in containers and landscapes alike. So just an all around solid full sun container here. Uh, that one happened to be growing in Chicagoland. These were a pair of containers in the gardens that really caught my eye, eye several times. I think feature a variety of stuff I think are worth noting. You'll notice in a few of these containers, especially that bright blue container, that's mostly foliage. I love that even without flowers, foliage just keeps giving and can look good without flowers all season long. Um, we'll shout out the Southern Living Collection with that skyscraper uh, Senecio in the back. How fun, succulent, but it's giving us blue color, kind of echoing the color of the fescue in the front, that blue fescue festina in front. We've got an herb in here as well. I absolutely love our Everleaf um, basil collection because they're late flowering. So you're not having to pinch flowers. You can eat this stuff, but they're ornamental as well. It's bringing us a nice neutral green in this container. That's emerald towers. So it grows straight up and has this beautiful columnar habit, but then some other foliage staples in there with the sedum, asparagus, that purple prince alternant thera. I use that in lots of containers. It seems to set off anything that's grown around it. So good things there. We move over to the container on the left. Got a caliber. There's so many fun, funky caliber co out there. This happens to be um, in that bumblebee collection, the hot pink from Ball Flora Plant. But you've got some fun uh, monochromatic pink tones in there, right? You've got a coleus that is Spitfire. Um, this is a micro coleus with that fun variegated um, and cut leaf edge. You've got a grass in the middle for texture that looks like um, that's. Uh, who is that? Phoenix Green, that Carex in the middle. That one's that can be a perennial for, for some folks in regions as well. So fun things happening. They've got coleus in the front. So I love these containers. I realize I take photos on my phone all the time of containers. I took photos of this one three times throughout the summer because it caught my eye that many times. So uh, just a lot of things here, right? You're using annual, perennial, succulent, vegetables, mix and match, go crazy. I just love a foundation of foliage and then you can build with flowers and color from there. On to a perennial container. I think we always forget that, you know, use perennials, mix them with annuals, do them alone, you know, go in the container and then they can go in the garden later. Um, we've got a few seed perennial items here, delphinium and the black blue diamonds. That's actually a delphinium grandiflorum instead of your standard delphinium elatum. So just a different style delphinium, but hardy to zone four. That's a tough tough plant with that bright blue that's hard to get in other plants. You've got Mesa, um, Gallardia there in the middle. Just what a summery look with the, the, the yellows, the golds and the, and the blues here. Um, you've got Stipa, that ponytails in the middle. In this application, it's just giving texture and a little life there in the middle. But Stipa is so fun. If you put it on the edge of a container, it'll actually drip, drape over like a ponytail. So I like to use it sometimes as a spiller in containers as well. And then Viola Delft Blue there in the front. I know for many of you, especially Southern gardeners, Viola make great perennials and will come back year after year. So uh, just a little a teaser in there as well.
but and how full, long full. You're, you know we're getting lots of color and, and lots of life out of perennials you know how Three long will this delphinium down. bloom delphinium that one will be in bloom actually a little bit longer than your standard alatums you know the alatums tend to throw up a big spike flower and then are done these will usually give you uh blooms for a good month right so that's not going to be the may to september flower that we get out of some of our annuals, but still enough time to, to give you a good season's worth. Yeah, the beauty of those, that diamonds blue is lots of branching. So even as some flowers get spent, you have more flowers that come back. Okay, so now we've got right. this fun one. <laughs> yeah, so this is actually my personal patio. I told you I don't have a yard. This is my gardening space here, six foot by 10 foot, and you better believe I chop it full of plants. Um, there in the foreground, you have that's a fuzzy fern frizz. That's an asparagus fern, but we're giving it some life and personality with eyeballs. This is taken in October, right? A little Halloween vibes going on here. So the kids in my local area love when you turned an asparagus fern into a monster or a creature. So don't be afraid to get playful with your plants. But also, if we get past the playfulness and the, the campiness of the asparagus, you see there's some real horticulture going on <laughs> behind there in my window boxes. I um, want to shout out some ornamental kales we got teased in there. Uh, Osaka from Sakata. Also have Crystal, that shiny one from Taki. Crystal ornamental cabbage is really beautiful in there. Got some hookara from Darwin perennials. We've got some of our pansies in there, that orange that you see teased through, some orange. Um, I'm a big plant nerd, and so I chalk these things full of stuff in the fall. Because here in Chicago, our season ends pretty abruptly in November. And so I try to garden as hard as I can in the fall. You see ornamental peppers in there. Um, that's a big one for us, particularly in the fall, that you've got color coming from fruit, not just flowers. So that Acapulco, we have teas in there. Also trailers with the Vinca. Um, I love a lot of things going on there. I love to play with purples, foliage, oranges in the fall. Really embrace that fall palette. So. And we go from fall to spring. Fall to spring. Spring, yeah. We heard a lot about, you know, monochromatic palettes, color echoing. I want to shout out our friends over at Chicago Botanic Garden. This is some nice color blocking they did. I think so simple. You have an annual flower mixed with a bulb plant and you echo those colors together. So in the foreground, you're seeing uh, frizzle sizzle pansy, pansy with a little frilly edge, but paired with a grape hyson carrying that beautiful blue through. You got anemone in the back and with the Mona Lisa echoing the hyacinth. And then fun, I think we don't use calcellaria enough. Another cool season crop there in the yellow echoing the daffodils. So uh, I think that's so simple, right? They just have two species per container, but really celebrating a color and something springy and bright with each. So and a couple of products I think we don't talk about enough at Pan American Seed with frizzle sizzle and those anemone. That anemone could, can be a cut flower or a garden plant, really pretty versatile. And lastly, I think I'll talk about Evergreen containers as well. I know even as our season gets spent, we still in Chicago, we have winter from from November all the way through April. So I do a lot of, um, of these evergreen containers. You can see like no no ornamental flowering plants in here, but I'm playing with a lot of foliage. So you've got peacock kale there on the bottom. Another fun, uh, I think, tucky uh, ornamental kale. I, I love that one for the texture and the color. But then again, collecting greens. You're seeing willow stems there, uh, birch poles. I've got a camisiparis golden mop there on the front that I ended up putting in the garden later. Um, you've got uh, the woven balls there as well that you can get a lot of texture and fun stuff out of non-living plant material and some stuff that you can harvest pretty economically if you've got spruce or willow on your property. Great way to just keep those containers going uh, all season long. Yep, and that's the winter. So that was, we got uh, a hoarfrost. Uh, this was actually when I lived in Ames, Iowa and went to Iowa State University um, where, where the frost covers the surface of everything. Look at how much that elevates that container. You really can celebrate the evergreen and the willow texture that's in there. This just gets me excited. When we don't have plants, we can still have beautiful gardens in the, in the dormant season. That's great. Okay, so I'm going to quit sharing. I'm going to ask a question of everybody, and then we're going to come back to sharing. Um, I think there were a lot of questions about containers. I think we'll let Barbara go first to talk about different types of containers and how you keep them watered, the size, et cetera. 
So while you guys talk about that, I'm going to quit sharing. Marcus, I'm going to fix that one slide and we'll bring it back. All right. So one of the things I think Becky mentioned, um, one of y'all mentioned about uh, protecting the soils uh, of your, uh, protecting the roots of your plants. Um, you know, I like using a double wall planter. Crescent has different type of, we have single wall, double wall. We also have a self-watering. Um, but having a double wall planter gives you an air. There'll be air in there that'll just act as an insulation uh, for your, for the roots. Um, you know, one of the things uh, I think can happen, especially in the South, is that you can get uh you know, you have these dark colored planters and they're out there in the hot sun on hot concrete, you know, and you basically fry the roots of your plants. So just finding ways to protect them. Um, does anybody else want to chime in on that um, while we're talking about that? I'll also say that our self-watering planters, um, Crescent Garden, our true drop planters uh, water from the bottom, but they have a reservoir that kind of comes up in that takes advantage of that double wall uh, planter and um, and so that not only do you have the air but you also have the water in there that helps protect it um, but it'll the self-watering is such when people who one of y'all one of the things was people do said do you have to have what happens what happens when you go on vacation um, you know with a self-watering planter our our true drop has a little indicator on it so it can tell you how much water is in there and um, so you can, if you're going to be gone for a long time, and, and we can get anywhere from two weeks to six weeks with our self-watering planters, but if you're going to be gone for a long time and you just want to tell your next door neighbor or your best friend, hey, come look at the little indicator. And if it says, you know, if it's showing that there's no water in there, um, they know that they can, that all they have to do is add water. They're not having to stick their finger in there and try to figure out, okay, should I water it? Should I not? So you've got your screen back, so I'll let you take over. Yeah, just showing that transition. So this is like a Mother's Day to 4th of July, how quickly those plants fill in and how big, you know, they look pretty tiny. Those griffin begonias when you plant them, but they really will take over. You know, Marcus, you've convinced here. me I need, I must have this begonia griffin. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's a fun yeah. one. It is a good one. Yeah. Okay. I might great. also speak to winter containers just because I'm from the north I, I heard a rule of thumb um, when you're overwintering shrubs and things or perennials and containers maybe um, overwinter something that's a zone colder than yours make sure those plants are tough to one zone above yours so if I'm in zone five if I want to overwinter something in a container outside make sure it's a zone four and oh, perspective to your zone I don't know if that's peer reviewed but that's just evidence that I've heard um, I don't always have faith in things that overwinter but I've overwintered shrubs that camisiparis I had in that evergreen container did just fine. I've had coral bells in containers out in the winter that over overwinter just fine. So, yeah, yeah, yeah I think sure. same thing. Marcus is go a zone lower, I guess, and uh, it'll help it survive over the winter. Yeah. And keeping them watered—that's the other big thing. Is people think, oh, winter's here, I'm done watering my containers, but giving them a good drink in the fall before we get into that first frost and then, mm. you know, keeping them hydrated as you can. Um, they're still living organisms. They might be dormant, but you got to keep, keep those root zones moist. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to throw this out uh, since you're talking about watering. Um, one of the things, one of the biggest mistakes I see with container gardening is that if people are using a traditional container, they forget that you have to have a hole in it for the water to drain. And that sounds like a really simple thing, but I cannot tell you how many people I know that have ruined their, you know, they think, oh, I'll just put rocks in the bottom or something like that. I mean, it's still going to fill with water if it's left outside and that water. So just make sure you've got good drainage. Good drainage. Good one. Yes. And what about the soil? Um, can we reuse the soil? Do you guys take half the soil out and put fresh soil in? Do you use slow release fertilizer? How do you prep the soil year after year after year for your containers, especially when you've got these huge containers that take a lot of soil to fill it? Okay, I'll jump in. 
because I just typically jump in like this all the time. Um, so I, I, I tell people they don't have to change their soil out every year. Um, if you're using, um, if you're changing your planters out, um, I tell them to pull all the, you know, pull the plants out and whatever roots come with that and leave the soil that's in there, put a handful of slow release fertilizer in there. And then you're going to, you know, when you put the new plants in there, you're going to be adding soil with that. And um, I mean, I, and, and I'd love to hear you, you know, the rest of y'all's thoughts on this too. But I mean, I can say, I usually tell people about every three or four years, then replenish all the soil. So y'all. Yeah, no, that's the okay. same guideline that I give. One to two years, not a problem. Just kind of top dress, top add. Definitely re-add that fertilizer because it is a small area that doesn't have access to soil and minerals that would naturally feed a plant. Um, but then three to five is when you do want to do a full refresh. Mm -hmm. But I, So back to the last question about, um, you know, I, say, I would say biggest uh, beginner mistake um, is not picking a big enough pot because you still mm -hmm. need a certain amount of soil volume um, to be able to water. And again, I'm thinking in the heat of summer and spring, um, if you don't have enough even soil to water, uh, then you actually, even if you watered every day, you're not really making an impact on hydrating those plants. And so make sure you have a big enough uh, pot for the combination that you're doing. Um, and actually, you know, Barbara, it's so funny because I was at the garden center last week and it is, yeah, you kind of have to flip the pots over because they 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 don't always have a hole drilled or, you know, they have a plug you need to remove. Mm -hmm. So there is still an extra step if you're not aware to, to make sure you look at it, even if it's an outdoor planter. Yeah, just flip your pot over and see if there's a plug you need to remove or there's usually a, uh, an area that shows you where to, you know, uh, drill a hole through. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And one thing I'll note talking about container sizes and soils. We haven't touched a whole lot on vegetable gardening and containers, but different considerations, I'd say, for vegetable gardening compared to flowers or, or shrubs, perennials, what have you, that especially if you're doing tomatoes or peppers, maybe a bigger container than what, than what you think you need is important. And there's some uh, varieties that are recommended for container gardening, and then some varieties that are just better left in the ground or done that way. So keep those things in mind as you're planting vegetables in containers, and if you're going to incorporate fertilizer, compost, organic matter, that might be different if we're, we're doing veggies and herbs. So we do have a question about wool pellets. I'm not sure if anybody here has any experience using wool pellets for wool pellets, not pallets, wool pellets for water retention and fertilization. I think they were fairly new a couple of years ago, but I... Yeah, I... I... I have tried a couple, uh, like I've tried them in a couple of pots and, um, I, you know, I don't, I can't say that I noticed like an extended amount of time between, and this was obviously not in a self-watering plant in a traditional planter. Um, I, I didn't, I, I didn't notice an extended amount of time, but I didn't feel like they were drying out as fast so that's a very unscientific answer, um, but it kind of makes sense, you know, because the the wool will hold the moisture. It's 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 almost like a natural way of using um, like the oh, so, like those soil absorb uh, uh, those little polymer things. Um, I can't remember what they're called, but um, so I would say. Uh, you know, I, I tried try. it. I liked it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you're, hel and you're helping our sheep farmers. By the yeah, end. exactly. Exactly. So, um, so we're at our full hour, but I'm going to take four extra minutes and I want each of you to just do a closing tip for container gardening. Like what, what is the one thing that you would like to tell everybody to encourage or inspire them with their container gardening? Who wants to go first with their closing tip? I'll go first. I think the beauty of container gardening is that it's temporary for the most mm. part, right? When you're designing landscapes, planting trees and retaining walls, that's a big decision that's gonna last a long time. The beauty of container gardening is you're gonna enjoy it for a season and probably switch it out soon enough anyway. So it's a 
great place to play and enjoy and just practice the art of horticulture. Just listen to plants, enjoy them, and, and have fun. And there's a lot of great resources out there. We, uh, we do have container solutions at Ball, but a lot of the breeding companies recommend stuff to blend together. So you've got an industry here that's to, here to support you. Mm -hmm. And kind of adding on that, I would say, because um, I do, I love that. I love that container gardens give you a chance to play. And in that, just accept the fact that there are going to be some plants that are going to die, you know, and and not let that make you feel like you can't keep doing it because there'll be more interesting plants that you can try again. And it gives you, I mean, don't look at it as failure, look at it as opportunity to try a new plant um, and, and just enjoy that. And, and I'm going to add one more little tip and that is don't be afraid to trim things back and like, um, you know, be aggressive with that because that will really encourage them to grow more. So don't be afraid to do that. Thank you. Becky or Jessica, who's next? I think making sure that, uh, I know it's a simple tip, but making sure you are putting potting soil in your container mm. and not garden soil, not native soil that you yeah. dig in the yard, not any of those other things. Make sure you're using potting soil. Thank you. Becky? Um, I think my tip is probably your pot doesn't have legs, but you do. So if your <laughs> pot is not happy, feel free to pick it up, move it around, take it to the garage on chilly days. That is the beauty of growing in containers is that a lot of these containers um, can scoot around with you. And so that gives you just so much flexibility. It's so different from gardening in the ground where moving a plant becomes an all day affair. This is just, it's container gardening is one of the best Things. If you're a Gemini, if you're a free spirit, if you don't like to be tied down, um, container gardening is for you. So. I love okay. it. That's good. I love it. Yes, I love it. Your containers don't have legs that you do. That's what a what a nice uh, closing sentiment there. Uh, with that, I want to thank all four of you for being our panelists today. Great inspiration, great tips. I thank everybody for attending. Yes, we're going to have. Um, the slideshow up on our website. I'll send a link out to you. I'll send a link to the chat and a video recording. So all I can say is go out, get your containers, get your plants, start gardening. If you haven't started already, experiment, try something new. Um, you'll you'll just keep improving. That's That's the joy of gardening, I think. So with that, thank you, everybody, and have a great afternoon and evening.